Part 2 During the eight days I took a daily lesson, an hour and a half. At the end of this twelve working hours apprenticeship, I was graduated, in the rough. I was pronounced competent to paddle my own bicycle without outside help. It seems incredible, this celerity of acquirement. It takes considerably longer than that to learn horseback riding in the rough. Now it is true that I could have learned without a teacher, but it would have been risky for me because of my natural clumsiness. The self-taught man seldom knows anything accurately, and he does not know a tenth as much as he could have known if he had worked under teachers. And besides, he brags, and is the means of fooling other thoughtless people into going and doing as he himself has done. There are those who imagine that the unlucky accidents of life, life's experiences, are in some way useful to us. I wish I could find out how. I never knew one of them to happen twice. They always change off and swap around and catch you on your inexperienced side. If personal experience can be worth anything as an education, it wouldn't seem likely that you could trip Methuselah. And yet if that old person came back here, it is more than likely that one of the first things he would do would be to take hold of one of these electric wires and tie himself all up in a knot. Now the sure thing, and the wiser thing, would be for him to ask somebody whether it was a good thing to take hold of. But that would not suit him. He would be one of the self-taught kind that go by experience. He would want to examine for himself. And he would find, for his instruction, that the coiled patriarch shuns the electric wire and it would be useful to him too, and would leave his education in quite a complete and rounded out condition, till he should come again some day and go bouncing a dynamite can around to find out what was in it. But we wander from the point. However, get a teacher. It saves much time and pawns extract. Before taking final leave of me, my instructor inquired concerning my physical strength, and I was able to inform him that I hadn't any. He said that that was a defect which would make uphill wheeling pretty difficult for me at first. But he also said the bicycle would soon remove it. The contrast between his muscles and mine was quite marked. He wanted to test mine, so I offered my biceps, which was my best. It almost made him smile. He said, It is pulpy and soft and yielding and rounded. It evades pressure and glides from under the fingers. In the dark, a body might think it was an oyster in a rag. Perhaps this made me look grieved, for he added briskly, Oh, that's all right. You needn't worry about that. In a little while, you can't tell it from a petrified kidney. Just go right along with your practice. You're all right. Then he left me, and I started out alone to seek adventures. You don't really have to seek them. That is nothing but a phrase. They come to you. I chose a reposeful Sabbath day sort of back street, which was about thirty yards wide between the curbstones. I knew it was not wide enough, still, I thought that by keeping strict watch and wasting no space unnecessarily, I could crowd through. Of course, I had trouble mounting the machine, entirely on my own responsibility with no encouraging moral support from the outside, no sympathetic instructor to say, Good, 
Now you're doing well. Good again. Don't hurry. There, now, you're all right. Brace up. Go ahead. In place of this, I had some other support. This was a boy who was perched on a gatepost munching a hunk of maple sugar. He was full of interest and comment. The first time I failed and went down, he said that if he was me, he would dress up in pillows. That's what he would do. The next time I went down, he advised me to go and learn to ride a tricycle first. The third time I collapsed, he said he didn't believe I could stay on a horse car. But the next time I succeeded and got clumsily under way in a weaving, tottering, uncertain fashion and occupying pretty much all of the street. My slow and lumbering gait filled the boy to the chin with scorn, and he sung out, My, but don't he rip along! Then he got down from his post and loafed along the sidewalk, still observing and occasionally commenting. Presently he dropped into my wake and followed along behind. A little girl passed by, balancing a washboard on her head, and giggled, and seemed about to make a remark, but the boy said rebukingly, Leave him alone, he's going to a funeral. I have been familiar with that street for years, and had always supposed it was a dead level. But it was not, as the bicycle now informed me, to my surprise. The bicycle, in the hands of a novice, is as alert and acute as a spirit level in detecting the delicate and vanishing shades of difference in these matters. It notices a rise where your untrained eye would not observe that one existed. It notices any decline which water will run down. I was toiling up a slight rise, but was not aware of it. It made me tug and pant and perspire, and still, labor as I might, the machine came almost to a standstill every little while. At such times, the boy would say, That's it. Take a rest. There ain't no hurry. They can't hold the funeral without you. Stones were a bother to me. Even the smallest ones gave me a panic when I went over them. I could hit any kind of a stone, no matter how small, if I tried to miss it. And, of course, at first I couldn't help trying to do that. It is but natural. It is part of the ass that is put in us all, for some inscrutable reason. It was at the end of my course, at last, and it was necessary for me to round too. This is not a pleasant thing, when you undertake it for the first time on your own responsibility, and neither is it likely to succeed. Your confidence oozes away, you fill steadily up with nameless apprehensions, every fiber of you is tense with a watchful strain. You start a cautious and gradual curve, but your squirmy nerves are all full of electric anxieties, so the curve is quickly demoralized into a jerky and perilous zigzag. Then suddenly the nickel-clad horse takes the bit in its mouth and goes slanting for the curbstone, defying all prayers and all your powers to change its mind. Your heart stands still, your breath hangs fire, your legs forget to work. Straight on you go, and there are but a couple of feet between you and the curb now. And now is the desperate moment the last chance to save yourself. Of course, all your instructions fly out of your head, and you whirl your wheel away from the curb instead of toward it. And so you go sprawling on that granite-bound, inhospitable shore. That was my luck. 
That was my experience. I dragged myself out from under the indestructible bicycle and sat down on the curb to examine. I started on the return trip. It was now that I saw a farmer's wagon poking along toward me, loaded with cabbages. If I needed anything to perfect the precariousness of my steering, it was just that. The farmer was occupying the middle of the road with his wagon, leaving barely fourteen or fifteen yards of space on either side. I couldn't shout at him. A beginner can't shout. If he opens his mouth, he is gone. He must keep all his attention on his business. But in this grisly emergency, the boy came to the rescue, and for once I had to be grateful to him. He kept a sharp lookout on the swiftly varying impulses and inspirations of my bicycle, and shouted to the man accordingly, To the left! Turn to the left, or this jackass will run over you. The man started to do it. No, to the right, to the right. Hold on, that won't do. To the left, to the right, to the left, right, left, right. Stay where you are, or you're a goner. And just then I caught the off horse in the starboard, and went down in a pile. I said, hang it. Couldn't you see I was coming? Yes, I see you was coming, but I couldn't tell which way you was coming. Nobody could, now could they? You couldn't yourself, now could you? So what could I do? There was something in that, and so I had the magnanimity to say so. I said I was no doubt as much to blame as he was. Within the next five days, I achieved so much progress that the boy couldn't keep up with me. He had to go back to his gatepost and content himself with watching me fall at long range. There was a row of low stepping stones across one end of the street, a measured yard apart. Even after I got so I could steer pretty fairly, I was so afraid of those stones that I always hit them. They gave me the worst falls I ever got in that street, except those I got from dogs. I have seen it stated that no expert is quick enough to run over a dog, that a dog is always able to skip out of his way. I think that that may be true, but I think that the reason he couldn't run over the dog was because he was trying to. I did not try to run over any dog, but I ran over every dog that came along. I think it makes a great deal of difference. If you try to run over the dog, he knows how to calculate. But if you are trying to miss him, he does not know how to calculate and is liable to jump the wrong way every time. It was always so in my experience. Even when I could not hit a wagon, I could hit a dog that came to see me practice. They all liked to see me practice, and they all came, for there was very little going on in our neighborhood to entertain a dog. It took time to learn to miss a dog, but I achieved even that. I can steer as well as I want to now, and I will catch that boy one of these days and run over him if he doesn't reform. Get a bicycle. You will not regret it, if you live. End of story.